All right, good morning and welcome to our Sunday School Hour this morning. We're certainly glad to see each one here this morning and uh, we're thankful for the visitors that God has sent our way and certainly it's our prayer that uh, messages today would be a blessing, a help and encouragement to each and every one. If you have your Bibles, let's turn together this morning to the book of Psalms once again. We're going through the book of Psalms and this morning we'll be looking at Psalm 62. Psalm 62. You'll remember from your reading of the Old Testament how that Israel, after they were delivered from bondage and they made their exodus from the land of Egypt, they marched across the Sinai Peninsula until they came to the Gulf of Aqaba. That's the eastern fork or the eastern part of the, of the Red Sea there. And as they stood there facing that body of deep water, they were surrounded, literally surrounded. Uh, the water was in front of them. There were high mountains on both sides going steeply down into the sea. And then there was the Egyptian army that was coming up behind them. Bottom line, they were, as one old saying goes, they were between the devil and the deep blue sea. Okay, they're in a bad spot. They're in a dangerous, they're in a dangerous place. No visible way at all of escape. They're, they're stuck. They're stuck. So the Bible says in chapter 14 of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 10, it says they're sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. But then after they had prayed, Moses says something that is very strange. He says something that is very strange. And in verse 13 and verse number 14 of that same chapter, Moses said, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And here's the reason why, verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you. He'll fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. You, you, you see, there will come times of trouble in every one of our lives. There will come times of difficulties when we are literally caught in a, in a hard place. I mean, we're between the devil and the deep blue sea, okay? Okay. And we're caught in this dangerous place. We're caught in this troublesome place. And during those times, we will cry out to God. We will cry out to God. And that certainly requires an element of faith. It certainly requires an element of faith. But I want you to understand this morning that real faith is seen. When after we have prayed, we are able to simply stand still. We're able to stand still and wait on God to work in our behalf. That's when real faith kicks in. That's when real faith is going to be seen. And that's exactly what we're going to see in our study as we go through this psalm together this morning. There, are, there, there is some debate as to the occasion of the writing of this psalm. There, there, there's some question about what it was that led to the writing of it. Some believe it was written during the time of David's trouble in the courts of King Saul. And, and, and then there are others who believe that it was written during the days of trouble in that matter with Absalom. Uh, personally, I agree with that second one. I believe this was written during the time when David is faced with the difficulties of Absalom and his attempted overthrow and, and, and all of that. But, but if you'll remember, we saw last week how that David, during that same period, he, he was filled with, we called it mixed emotions. He's filled with mixed emotions after Absalom's rebellion had been put down. You remember we saw how that uh, David is in a place of safety right now. He was staying with a man named Barzil Lai uh, in the city of Mahanaim. And, and so he's in a place of safety. This man was a patriot. He was a man loyal uh, to King David. But, but David, on the other hand, even though he's in a place of safety, he has this desire. He, he wants to go back to Jerusalem. He, he wants to go back to his city, to his palace, back to his throne. But, but you remember we saw how that more importantly, David desired to go back to Jerusalem because that's where 
the tent of the Lord God was located. In other words, David wants to be back in the presence, near to where God might be found. And, and so David, though, he's kind of got mixed emotions. Safety one side, desire to be over here on the other side. Mixed emotions because David did not know what unknown enemies might be waiting for him in Jerusalem. There might be some that are still loyal to Absalom. And, and so he, he has these mixed emotions. And so well, we saw how that then David turned to the Lord God in prayer. Turned to the Lord God in prayer. It's interesting that immediately after the psalm that records for us David's prayer, we find this psalm. And we find this psalm where David is purposing in his heart that he's going to wait on God. He's going to wait on God. As I mentioned before, many times we come to the Lord God to pray about some dangerous and situation, some frustrating situation that comes into our lives. But as soon as we say, in Jesus' name, I pray, amen, we are up and off and running to try to fix everything in our own strength. We're off and running, trying to take care of all things in our own power. And so most generally, we meet with disastrous results because even though we prayed, we didn't wait on God. We prayed and asked God to do something, but then we didn't wait for Him to do it. We're just off and running, trying to handle everything in our own strength and in our own power. And the sad thing is that even though we pray, we, we don't patiently, patiently wait for Him. With that as an introduction, I want us to notice the title that's given to this psalm. It is to the chief musician to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. Now in this title, there are two things that we're going to notice. First of all, there are the addressees. You'll notice this time it is plural. It is addressed to two people. It's addressed to two people. First of all, it is addressed to the chief musician. This, of course, as we have seen before many times. This is the chief musician. It's the, it's the leader of the music, the leader of the orchestra uh, there in the, in the tabernacle or in the temple. Uh, so it's addressed to the chief musician, but it's also addressed to this, to this man, Jeduthun. Jeduthun. Uh, the Bible tells us that Judith, Jud, uh, blah, 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 uh, <laughs> Jeduthun and his sons, the Bible tells us that they were actually porters who were employed and serving in the tabernacle that David had built for the, for the ark of the Lord God. Uh, two different Hebrew words have been translated porters in our, in our English Bible. And, and by using the concordance, we find that these men who are referred to as porters, it, it, it speaks in a twofold sense. First of all, they, they watched, these were men who watched the tabernacle gates. You find that in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 16, verse number 38. The, these were men who, who, who watched the, the tabernacle gates, and they were not only watchers, we might call them security, okay? Not only are they watchers, but, but they also, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 42, we're told that these porters were actually the door of the tabernacle. In other words, to enter into that holy area, you had to go through them. You had to go through, that's who these porters were. That's who these porters were. And so that's who this psalm is being addressed to. Those who are the watchers, they are the, the porters. They are the ones who watch, who guard, and who are the door to God's tent. That's who it's addressed to. Of course, then we also see number two, there's the writer. And, and, and as we know, the writer is clearly identified for us. Uh, the writer is David himself. So with that as an introduction, let's begin now our, our study of this psalm by noticing a couple of things together. Number one, I want us to notice David's position. As he's writing this psalm, I want us to notice his position. Being the, being the great warrior king that he was, David well understood the importance of knowing where things are located on a field of battle. Being a warrior king, he understood the importance of knowing where things are located. And therefore, David, David was well aware. He was well aware. He knew the position of a couple of things. First of all, he knew the position of his defenses. He, he knew where his defense could be found. He knew where his defense was located. 
Uh, David defenses, you understand. It was not his armies. His defenses were, were not his wealth. His, his defenses were not his charisma, his personality, uh, not his abilities. Uh, rather, his defense, David understood this. His defense is in the Lord God. He, he understood that point very clearly. His defense is in the Lord God. And so notice two things David says. First of all, he makes the declaration that his salvation was in, in God. His salvation is in God. Uh, Psalm 62, verse number 1, it begins with these words, Truly, without a doubt, truly, my soul waiteth. There it is. My soul waiteth upon God. The Hebrew word translated waiteth in this text. It's used four times in the Bible. Interestingly, it's only found in the writings of David. It's only found in the writings of David. But there's an expanded meaning that is given to this word. Notice it in Psalm 39. In Psalm 39, we saw it before. Psalm 39, verse number 2. He said, I was dumb with silence. That's the same Hebrew word translated waiteth. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace. You see, here's the point. For David, waiting on God meant facing his times of trouble. Waiting on God meant facing his times of difficulty and doing it in silence. In other words, waiting on God without murmuring, without complaining, without, without all of the things that many times we do when we're faced with difficult situations and we begin to speak against God, which was the very thing you remember in our study on Wednesday nights going through the book of Job. That's the very thing Job avoided. In, in, in spite of all the difficulties that he faced and the trials and circumstances, Job, the Bible says, did not sin against the Lord with his lips by bringing foolish accusations against the Lord. It means waiting in silence. And the importance of this is seen when we remember the warning in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his Maker. In other words, woe to the man, woe to the woman who argues with God, that speaks against God when they are faced with times of difficulty. David understood, first of all, his salvation was in God. There's another thing David understood about his defenses, and that is this. He understood that his security was in God. His security was in God. Verse number 2, David says, He is, talking about the Lord God, He is my defense. and I shall not be greatly moved. In other words, David understood that not only would the Lord God save him from his enemies, but the Lord God would also defend him from the attacks of his enemies who would seek to utterly destroy him and cause him to be greatly moved. To be greatly moved. By the way, let me just tell you, anytime our troubles, our difficulties, our trials, our testings in life, anytime we allow those things to greatly move us, you know what that means? It means it has moved us away from God. And David is determined. I'm not going to be greatly moved. I'm not going to be greatly moved. And so after considering his defenses, David then considers, on the field of battle, you not only need to know, not only do you need to know where your, where your defenses are, you need to know where your enemy is, right? You, you better know where the enemy is. And, and so David considered the position, letter B, he considered the position of his enemies. His position of the enemies. And I want you to notice there's a couple of things that we see here. First of all, he has a question for them. He has a question for them. In, in verse number 3, he says, How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Now Absalom, you remember, Absalom and his crowd had sought for David's destruction. They, they, they wanted to drive him from the throne, but that's not all. You remember there was the counsel that was given that, that now that David has fled the city, it's a good time. You, you go find him, kill him. 
uh, do away with him. They, they, sought, they sought his destruction. Uh, but now Absalom is dead. Absalom is dead. But the crowd that had followed him, uh, they're still around. They're still around. And so, and so his question is, how, how long are you going to imagine this mischief? But not only does he have a question for them, he also has a warning for them. He has a warning for them. In, in verse number 3, he says, Ye shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. A bowing wall and a tottering fence. I remember years ago, I worked in construction. And we were pouring a, we were pouring a foundation for a, for, for a building. And so we had built up the forms. Uh, we, had, we had them braced and all of that. And, and, and the, the truck of concrete came in and, and we began pouring the concrete into the form. And, and, and then we noticed, we noticed our, our form. It was kind of starting to, it was starting to kind of bulge. Okay. It, it's starting to bow. It, it, that, that form was starting to bulge. And, and, and we, we realized that uh, we're headed. We're headed for a catastrophe here, and so we had to stop the pouring. We had to go in. We had to. We had to put more bracing on that wall. We had to put. We had to put support there. In, in other words, what David is saying here is simply saying uh, to his enemies, "You are certainly going to fall, just like a bowing wall, like a tottering fence. You're going to fall." You're going to. What you're doing will not be successful. And, and the reason for the fall. The reason why his enemies are going to fail. It's outlined for us in the very next verse. Verse number four. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. Now David's not talking about himself here. Uh, David is speaking of the fact that the desire of his enemy is that they're fighting against the Lord God. See, they're not just fighting against David. They're fighting against the Lord God who anointed David and put him in the position that he was holding. And so not only are they fighting against man, uh, against a the man, they're fighting against the God of that man. And so they consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. David's enemies basically are subversive. They're subversive. They are deceitful. They are hypocritical. And so therefore David warns them that they are headed for a certain fall. They're headed for a certain fall. And then he adds that important word. We've seen it many times. It's the little word, Selah. Think about that. Sing that line again. Meditate on that thought. To fight against what God has established is never going to prosper. It's never going to work out. It's never going to go well. To fight against what God has established is certainly going to be an exercise of futility. It's going to fall. It's going to fall. It may seem like it's prospering for now, but eventually it's all going to come apart. It's all going to fail. Think about that. Selah. Think about that. So we see, first of all, there is, there is David's position. But then I want you to notice a second thing, and that's David's counsel. David's counsel. Many times, we are told that if a person begins talking to their self, that's not a good sign. You know, if you start talking to yourself, people start, they begin to wonder about you, okay? Uh, however, the truth is, there are times when talking to yourself, now if you start answering yourself, you may be in trouble, but, but there are times when, when talking to yourself, okay, it might be good. It, it might be good to talk to yourself because see, there are times when we basically need to take a good, hard look at ourselves in the mirror, and we need to give ourselves a good talking to. We need to give ourselves a good talking to. David's been facing troubling times. 
His, his emotions have been all over the place. He, he's going through this time of trial and testing and, and, and he's filled with all these different kinds of emotions. And so after taking a good look, taking a good look at his defenses and taking a good look at his enemies, David is going to calm himself down by having a good talk with himself. He's going to talk to himself and he's going to have three things that he's going to say to himself as he looks at himself in the mirror in light of what is going on in his life. First thing that David is going to say to himself is this. Be still. Just be still. Notice it in verse number five. My soul. Remember, he's talking to himself. My soul. Wait. Now, same as before, back in verse number one. Means to be silently trusting. Without complaint, without murmuring. Just silently trusting. David says, my soul, wait thou only upon God for my expectation, my hope, my security. It's from Him. It's from Him. John Trapp, the old English commentator, he died in 1669. I think he said it very well. Here's what John Trapp had to say. He said, they trust not in God at all who trust Him not alone. In other words, if you are not completely trusting in God, you're not really trusting in God. If you're not really trusting in Him in every situation you face in your life, you're not really trusting Him. You're not really trusting Him. And that's exactly the idea David is expressing. He's waiting on the Lord God and, and, and none other to take up his cause because he understood the faithfulness of the Lord God. He understood that the Lord God is a faithful God. He's a good God. He's a God who never fails. Not only does David say to himself, be still, he also says this, be sure, be sure. Verse number six, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Actually, this is almost, if you think about it, this is, this is almost exactly word for word for the sentiment that we saw just a few minutes ago. It's almost exactly the same cement, uh, sentiment we saw back in verse number two. However, there, there is one word, if you compare them together, uh, there is one word that is omitted. There's one word that is missing. You see, before, back in verse number two, David said he would not be greatly moved. But now as David talks to himself, as David is getting hold of his emotions, his confidence has increased. His confidence has increased. You see, David understood that in order for his enemies to get at him, they would have to crush God's protection. In order for his enemies to destroy him, they would have to cancel God's salvation. And for in order for his enemies to have their way with him, they would have to conquer God's defenses. And that could never happen. And therefore, David is absolutely confident. He does not say now, I shall not be greatly moved. He says, I shall not be moved at all. I'm not going to be moved. I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to be troubled. Because my hope, my trust, my faith is in the Lord God. And because of his soaring confidence, David now speaks to himself again with a third thing. With a third thing, and that is this. Be strong. Be strong. Verse number seven. Then, in other words, David is encouraging himself to understand that the source of his strength is going to be the Lord God himself. In, in God is my salvation. Not in my own wisdom, not in my own thinking, not in my own abilities. No, 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 none of that, none of that. In God. In God is my salvation and my glory. And in God is the rock of my strength. In God is my refuge. See, all of that ties together. 
All of that ties, and all of it, all of it, notice the last three words, all of it is in God. All of it is in God. Now after David had talked to himself, his heart was so encouraged in the Lord God that he wants to share that encouragement with others. He, he wants to share that encouragement that he has received. He, he wants to share that with other people. And so, and so therefore, he, gives, he, he inserts this little word of, of encouragement for, for, for all of God's people. Here's what he says. He says, trust in Him. Most of the time. No, that's not what it says, is it? No, no, no that's not what it says. No, trust in Him at all times. Who's He talking to? Ye, His people. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge. A place of safety. A place of hiding. A place where we can go and find deliverance from the enemies that would seek to destroy us and tear us down. God is a refuge for us. And again, Selah, think about that. Consider that wonderful truth and how wonderful it is. Third thing that we find in this psalm, and that is David's learning. David's learning. Every, every situation that we face in life, it should be a learning experience. For, for, for those of you who've been around for a while and you remember it, uh, our little school of theology, Dan Moore was here. And, and, and you'll remember what he called his exams. Do you remember that? He would give an exam. He always called it a learning experience. Yeah, it's a, it's a learning experience. I never could get my head wrapped around that. To me, an exam was kind of like purgatory. It was miserable, okay? But, but he called it a learning experience. And, and with every situation we face, actually, it should be a learning experience. Everything we go through in life, there's, there's something there we ought to learn. There, there's a lesson there that God wants to teach us. And, and it was certainly true for David. As a result of the things that David went through, there, there were some things that he learned. First of all, he learned something about men. He learned something about men. Notice it in verse number 9. He notices that their loyalty is vain. Here's what he says. Surely... Men of low degree are vanity. In, in other words, they're, they're not to be trusted. That's the idea. Men of low degree are vanity. They're not to be trusted. And, and men of high degree <laughs> are a lie. They claim to be faithful. They claim to be your friend. They claim to be on your side. But it's a lie. It's a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. In other words, if you take the man of low degree, the man of high degree, and you lump them all together and you put them in the scales, both of them together will actually weigh less than nothing. They weigh less than nothing. That's why the psalmist is going to see later on, and we'll get there maybe in couple of months, couple of years, I don't know. But in Psalm 146, verse number 3, here's David's advice. Don't put your trust in princes. Don't put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is, bottom line, there's no help. There is no help there. And so that's what David learns about men. He learns something about their loyalty. Number two, he learns, well, he learns their loyalty is vain. Not only that, he learns, he learns about their vanity is their vain in their wealth. Their, their wealth is also vain. Uh, Russell Conwell, back in 1877, he was at Temple University in the U.S. and, and he became known as the as the one who coined uh, this little quote. Here's what he said: He said, "Money is power, and you ought to be reasonably ambitious to have it." Money is power, and it ought to be your reasonable ambition to try to have as much of it as you can. Okay? Of course, now in these days in which we live, all of that has been shortened. 
Uh, today, we just say money is power. Money is power. But David had learned something totally different. David had learned something totally different. Notice it in verse number 10. He says, trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. In, in other words, there are those who would oppress people. They would rob people because they think money is power. And so they do everything and everything that they can to try to get more and more money. And, and, and David says, David says, don't trust in that. Don't trust in that. And, and then he gives this word of advice. If riches increase by your honest labors, set not your heart on them. Set not your heart on them. In other words, money is never the real answer to the problems that you will face in your life. They never, money will never deliver you from the problems. In fact, truth of the matter is, money will increase your difficulties and increase your problems. You say, how can that be? Well, let me ask you just one simple question. Have you ever heard of a person kidnapping a poor boy to hold him for ransom? You never heard of that, have you? You know why? They don't, they don't kidnap poor people and hold them for ransom. They kidnap rich kids and hold them for ransom because they can know mom and dad's got the money, right? And so money isn't an answer to problem. Many times money actually increases our problems. It makes things to be more difficult. It actually can place us in a position where it's even more dangerous for us. In fact, that's why John Wesley, John Wesley made this statement. He said, when I have money, I get rid of it quickly. Now in my house, I don't have to do that. Ginger does that for me. <laughs> <clears throat> but when I have money, here's what John Wesley said. When I have money, I get rid of it quickly. And here's the reason why. Lest it find a way into my heart. Wow, that's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. So David, David, he's learned something about men. He's learned their, their vain loyalty. He's learned about their, their vain wealth. But not only has he learned some things about men, not only has he learned some things about men, he's learned some things about God. He's learned some things about God. Verse 11 and verse number 12, God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. For thou renderest to every man. That word renderest simply means he's, he repays. He compensates. He renders to every man according to his work. Through his time of trouble, David once again is reminded of the Lord God's power. He's reminded of the Lord God's mercies. Even as he's going through these times of trouble, he's reminded of the Lord God's absolute justice that He does all things well and He makes no mistakes. Again, as we've said before, I don't know what kind of troubles or what kind of problems you may be facing in your life today, whether it be at home or work or wherever. I don't know what kind of problems or trials or difficulties that you may be going through, but my prayer, my prayer for each and every one of us this morning is that we will learn these very same things that David learned. That, that these very same things will become a reality in our own heart and in our own life. And that when we're going through those difficult times of trial and testing, that we will have the faith to bring them as we are admonished to do in Scripture, to come boldly to the throne room of grace and to, and to lay our petitions, our needs, our fears, our concerns, to, to lay them all at the feet of our Savior. But, but then that God will give us the wisdom that when we say amen, we will leave our problems with Him and not pick them up and carry them trying to solve them ourselves but just to wait, to wait on the Lord, to see His salvation, to see what He can do and what He will do 
for those who trust Him. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word, for these things that we've been able to learn together. I pray that You would take these few thoughts, apply them in each heart and in each life according to, according to our needs. Lord, You know what we're going through in our lives. You know the situations that we're facing. Lord, I pray that You would give us the wisdom to learn the lessons that David learned. And may we always be faithful to wait on You, to trust You, knowing that, again, You do all things well. You make no mistakes. We pray that You would dismiss us now from this hour, blessing the hour that is to follow. We ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. We've got about 20 minutes and we'll begin the morning service.